not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. He either, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over-aggressive high-fives to his buddies. <laughs>Before we dive into the Vicky Lung goodness, we've got a quick announcement. You all may have received an email from me a couple of months ago if you're on the ASAP listserv regarding a problem that we felt needed a solution. Yeah, we couldn't really find a website out there that had tons of images that were totally copyright free for anyone to download and share with no restrictions. Now this is a problem for anyone who creates educational content like, say, podcasts or lectures to residents or writes book chapters or whatever. It seems like we spend too much time looking for images that we know others in the community have and would share. And when we see a problem, we like to create a solution if possible. Now, there are lots of great sites with tons of cool images, but there seem to always be some restrictions as far as downloading and using the images. We wanted it to be totally open source. Give and take as much as you like with no restrictions. Use them for good, for evil, for whatever. We trust you. So we found someone else who thought this was a problem, Mike Stone, who's the current ASAP Ultrasound Section Chair. So we teamed up with Mike, and we created this new site. Sonocloud.org is where you can find it. Right now, it's being supported by the Ultrasound Podcast, and although Mike Stone is a huge part of this, it's not officially affiliated with the ASAP Ultrasound Section or any other group. We're talking to some groups about maybe supporting it in the future, but we plan on keeping it a totally free resource forever, and don't want to put any advertising or anything else up that would detract from the mission at this time. We're telling you about it because we need your help to make it great. Yes, please share. Now, we've got it started with tons of our own images, but now we want to ask you to upload all the images and videos you care to share so that this is actually a useful site. If we all share, then this could be an incredible resource. Of course, please de-identify your clips and don't upload copyrighted images. If you need help de-identifying, check out Mike Stone's post on de-identifying clips on the podcast site. We've put a significant amount of resources and time toward this, and as the podcast and app have always been, this is totally free to all. However, we are asking you for something in return this time. Share! This will only work if we all pitch in and make it great. Feel free to use it and start giving us feedback so we can make it even better. Now here's a quick demo by Mike Stone on how exactly to use the site, how to upload and download images. And then after that, it's on to Vicky and Lungs. Hey guys, this is Mike Stone. This is how you upload to sonocloud.org. Open a browser, go to sonocloud.org. If you're not registered, click here to register for free. If you're registered already, go ahead and log in. At the top of the screen, click on Upload Video. Make sure you don't have any protected health information on the video file that you're uploading. Browse videos. Select the file you want to upload. Click Open. It's going to upload here and give you a progress bar. You can go ahead and add tags separated by commas if you'd like. That makes it searchable later for users coming to the site. Select the category that best fits. Save the data and you're finished. If you go to home now, you'll see that video is already uploaded and available. User can come to the site, click on it, view the video, or go directly over here and download the video for their own use. Hello everyone, Matt here. Several months ago we had Vicky Noble on the podcast, and you people loved it. You've been asking for her ever since, so we're going to give you what you want. We've got Vicky on for a long month this month. Now if you don't know who Vicky Noble is, then get your head out of you know where and pay attention. Come on. Vicki Noble. She's the ultrasound director at Mass General. She's the immediate past chair of the ASAP Ultrasound Section. She's the author of Manual of Emergency and Critical Care Ultrasound. She's a powerhouse. That's who she is. She's earned the nickname the Lung Queen most recently in ultrasound circles for all of her amazing research on lung ultrasound. Now, she's done way too much research for me to go into it now and start naming things. That would basically be an hour of the podcast. So I'll let you Google her name and look her up and see all the amazing stuff that she's done. I gotta be honest with you though. The most impressive thing about Vicky is not her research or her incredible academic prowess. Recently, Vicky helped us teach Castlefest in Kentucky, and my wife met her when we went to the Woodford Reserve, a distillery, for dinner. My wife had no idea who Vicky was. She just met her as, hey, this is Vicky Noble. And afterwards, she told me, wow, she was maybe the nicest person I've ever met. And she's right. Vicky is an incredibly kind, generous person who everyone who knows her considers her maybe the nicest person they know. But I don't want to bore you with those things. We all know 
how nice Vicki is. We all know how incredible she is and all the research that she does and the great contribution to emergency ultrasound that she's provided. I want to dig a little deeper, give you something that you may not know. So I went to the mother of all searches. I googled her name and this is what I found. She's actually even more prolific than I thought. She's actually a feminist shamanic healer, an independent author, and a wisdom teacher. And the most impressive thing really I think is her shape-shifting ability. I mean look at these pictures. These don't look anything like the Vicki Noble I know, but they're associated with her name in Google, so I, I know this is Vicki Noble. She's also not only faculty at Mass General, but faculty of the Energy Medicine University. She created the Mother Peace Tarot deck. And let me tell you, if you're going to have one tarot deck ever, I mean this is the one, the Mother piece one. I mean, it's the mother of all tarot decks. It's incredible. And she's got a new book out. I wouldn't feel right if I didn't give it a little plug. Shakti Woman, Filling Our Fire, Healing Our World, The New Female Shamanism. It's an incredible read. You know, it's summer. If you're going to be at the beach, this is an incredible beach read. I promise you open it up, you'll get through it in a day. I just recently read it at the beach and it was wonderful. I think it's right up there with her earlier works like the Manual of Emergency and Critical Care Ultrasound and Mother Peace, Away to the Goddess. So sit back, enjoy Vicky. She's going to come at you with some incredible long ultrasound this month and you know if we're lucky she may even tell us a little bit about how to find the, our own goddess you know as mike always says there's a little shakti woman in all of us hey everybody mike here bet you thought you were going to get the education bomb dropped on you by vicky noble well that was the plan but instead you got me why this horrible deception well, as you know, this lecture was recorded at Castle Fest 2012, and Matt Dawson happened to give Vicky one of the funniest introductions I've ever heard in my life. In fact, I think you just heard it on this podcast. So, as you can imagine, I was so busy laughing at the time that Vicky started talking that I actually forgot to hit the record button until about slide six. Amateur, I know. So to make it up to you, I'm going to go through the first six slides in my best Boston accent, which will probably sound something like a mix between a Russian and a Jamaican accent, since those are the only two accents I can really do. But don't worry, this won't take long. We'll get you to the noble education you deserve in no time. So uh, here we are on slide two. So here uh, Vicky's discussing how radiation's bad for you and uh, expensive, but uh, you know ultrasound's awesome. <laughs> All right, so I can't do the Boston accent the entire time. I'll have to punch myself in the face. Instead, I'm just gonna go through them. In slide three, uh, Vicky uh, tells us what we're gonna be learning about today. So she says we're gonna cover pneumothorax, pulmonary effusions, interstitial fluid, which includes pulmonary edema and bronchiolitis, pneumonia, and ARDS. Now, we're just going to, you're just listening to part one of the podcast uh, of Vicky's lecture. We're breaking it into two parts. So at this time, we're going to be listening to pneumothorax and pulmonary effusions. So let's get to it. In looking for pneumothorax, there's two signs that you're looking for. There's the lung sliding sign and the comet tail sign. Now, Vicky's going to talk more about these later, but for now, let's just keep in mind that if either of these signs are present, the patient does not have a pneumothorax. But if the patient does not have these signs, if they don't have either one of them, i.e. there's no lung sliding and there's no comet tails, then they do have a pneumothorax. Lung scanning for pneumothoraces is performed with a linear probe, which is a high-frequency probe, and gives us good resolution at shallow tissue depths. The probe should be placed in the anterior and lateral chest, and the probe marker should be oriented towards the patient's head. We'll start with Vicky showing us a video of normal lung sliding and talking about the locations of pneumothoraces in your average patient. ...that you're concerned about. If your patient is supine, the place this air is going to layer is in the anterior chest wall. And if your patient is upright, the place the air is going to layer is in the upright apices. So obviously, you don't have to look at every single rib space to rule out every single um, um, area if you're trying to rule out big things that are causing hypotension, causing shock. If you're trying to look at things to send people home, you may be a, a little more careful, and you may look in a few more rib spaces. So this is what it looks like with rib slide or lung sliding. And then this is a pneumothorax. And you can see now, you see the rib shadow, you see the rib shadow, you see the parietal pleura here, but you've lost that shimmering sliding motion. I'll go back. This is the sliding. And this is the no sliding. Sliding. No sliding. So it's you know, once you've trained your eye to look at this, the nice thing about this is this takes such a short amount of time that that's why it's become part of the trauma evaluation and part of your shock evaluation because you can look very quickly and move on to something else when you've ruled it out. There are other ways you can document this. You can use color Doppler to show the movement of the pleura and power Doppler. Um, also down here, this is a still image where you use M mode, and you can see that the chest wall areas here are not moving, so they're kind of this straight barcode sign, 
whereas the lung sliding down below, when it's moving back and forth, will have this grainy appearance here, and they call this the seashore sign. I don't actually think you need to use either of these. I think you can just see the sliding with your own eye very easily, and if you can save a clip on your machine, that's all you need to do. The nice thing about this is there's actually a lot of literature on this, and most of it has been done in Europe. They're very lung crazy in Europe, but um, the negative predictive value for these studies is, is pretty impressive. There's not many tests that we have that have studies like this, and these are you know, not small studies that show a 100% or near 100% negative predictive value. Now I know you know this, but just to be clear, the negative predictive value is the chance that the disease is absent when the test is negative. Put another way, the chance that the test is correct when it is negative. So 99 to 100% of the time is pretty good. Now this statistic, a negative predictive value, can be misleading sometimes. And for more in-depth analysis on that, for all you stat nerds, go to Smart EM and listen to David Newman. We're not going to discuss that here. But in summary, as long as these studies prevalence of disease was high enough, meaning they weren't testing a bunch of people who obviously didn't have the disease, then these negative predictive numbers are very impressive. It's certainly better than a chest x-ray in the supine patient. The value for these studies is, is pretty impressive. There's not many tests that we have that have studies like this, and these are, you know, not small studies that show a 100% or near 100% negative predictive value. The onus is on us to look in a couple rib spaces to make sure we're not just doing a very short screen. But I think once you've looked anteriorly in the supine patient or in the apices in the upright patient, you can be very confident that you have looked at this in a very uh, careful way. And in some ways, it's almost, as we start to use this, it gets almost too sensitive because you're going to find small areas of pneumothorax that don't even show up on your chest x-ray. So, um, you know, again, you have to decide when you look at this whether you want to put in a chest tube based on a clinical scenario. But making the diagnosis <coughs> using ultrasound, I think, is very helpful. Okay, so I want to reiterate something that Vicki just said here and want to preempt something that you may hear someday. Now, I've heard people say that ultrasound is so good that it's too sensitive for pneumothorax. Now, I don't want to argue with these people, but... That's just stupid. Obviously, when you get a test that is really sensitive like this, then you're going to pick up some pneumos that don't need an intervention. But as Vicky said, you have to decide clinically, looking at the patient if they need a chest tube or intervention. I mean, come on, you're a doctor. This is why you get paid to make these decisions. I mean, personally, I want the information. Does this patient have a pneumothorax? Then I decide what to do with it. If you want to start a fight with me, then tell me to my face that a test is too sensitive to use. Now, I'm not going to go on forever about test characteristics, but if you're giving up a ton of specificity for a small increase in sensitivity, then fine, we don't want that kind of more sensitive. But this is not the case here. No test is simply too sensitive without taking into consideration other test characteristics. So Vicki, thank you very much for debunking this and telling us that we need to make a decision clinically. And I'm very sorry for interrupting. Please continue. I think it's very helpful. Okay, any questions on pneumothorax? We're going to kind of go through this relatively quickly. Okay, the other um, thing that I think is very useful here is looking for pleural effusions. And we talk a lot about the mirror image. So if the mirror image is present, there's no effusion. And if the mirror image is absent, there is an effusion. But I'm going to show you another trick, which I think is actually easier than the mirror image. Many of you may have experienced the thing where you're looking at the lungs and you're not sure if there's a mirror image. And sometimes it can be very um, hard to see that. And so there's something called the spine sign, which I'm going to show you, um, which I think is actually much easier to see. OK, but what is a mirror image? Just to go over that kind of quickly, what happens is the sound comes out from the ultrasound. It hits a curved surface, like the diaphragm. It gets reflected, and it hits something like in the, within the liver tissue. Some of that sound also goes back to the diaphragm and back up to the probe. And the reason why you're getting a mirror image is because distal to the diaphragm, you have air. And remember, the air scatters sound. So nothing is coming back distal from the diaphragm. And so the ultrasound machine thinks that everything traveled in a straight line and puts the lung tissue above the diaphragm. That only happens when there's no sound waves being transmitted from the tissue above the diaphragm, for example, when you have an aerated normal lung. So this is when, when you see the mirror image, when you see liver tissue above and below the diaphragm, then you can be very sure that you have ruled out a uh, pleural effusion. Okay, so here's a picture of the Morrison's pouch, which you looked at a lot yesterday and over the last couple days. Here's your liver, here's your diaphragm, here's your kidney, and you can see here that there's tissue above and below 
the diaphragm that looks very similar. You don't see any black fluid or anything like that. And so this is a normal mirror image ruling out a new, uh, pleural effusion. <coughs> this is what you see when you see a big pleural effusion. And as you can see, because now there's something above the diaphragm that is reflecting the sound, you can actually see the black fluid above the diaphragm. The thing that I think is actually easier is, is you can also see this spine sign or this spine shadow. Now, in a normal aerated lung, you can see the spine as you look th through the liver, but the spine is going to stop at the diaphragm when there's a normal lung because the sound will hit the air in the thoracic <coughs> cavity and can't penetrate to the thoracic spine. So in a normal lung, you'll have the diaphragm and the spine sign kind of stopping right here. And every time the person takes a breath, the diaphragm is going to cover up part of the spine as it comes down in the chest cavity. When you have something in the thoracic cavity that can transmit sound, now your thoracic spine is visible above the diaphragm because the sound can go all the way through the fluid or the consolidation or the pneumonia and hit the thoracic spine. So seeing this spine go above the diaphragm, I know right away that there's something in the thoracic cavity that can transmit sound. And I think it's much easier to see that than to actually look and see the mirror image sometimes. So just remember that as a backup if, you, if you're not sure. <coughs> Again, this is normal. Here you can see the spine sign. You can also see a big pleural fusion. And here, this might be a little less easy to see. You can see, well, is this a mirror image? But I can see the thoracic spine above the diaphragm, and so I know that there's fluid in the thoracic cavity. So I think this is why it's much easier sometimes to, to look <coughs> at it this way. And again, the, the nice thing about the literature is that the negative predictive value is we see very small pleural effusions now when you're looking in that little cul-de-sac space, and you can see this in a very sensitive way. So no, no spine sign and a mirror image <coughs> present can effectively rule out a pleural effusion. Um, and I think it's, it's actually, again, much more sensitive than a supine chest X-ray, chest X-ray. And I'll show you some pictures later about that. The other thing is it's very helpful to guide procedures. So, you know, like with um, line placement or peripheral IVs, all that kind of stuff, you can see that there's a lot of evidence that shows if you watch your needle go in to d drain your pleural effusion, and you can see the depth, you can actually see the visceral pleura, so you know where you can't go beyond. And a trick that I use, um, which uh, you know, a lot, it wasn't my idea, but I've stolen it from other people, is that you can measure the depth from the skin to the pocket of fluid, and then cut off the needle cap at that depth. So your needle won't go any further than where the needle cap is end. And that way, when you're, when you're putting the needle into someone's back to drain the fluid, you get to a certain point, and then you can pull it out and be sure that you're not going to go into the visceral pleura and cause a pneumothorax. So I think it's um, mm -hmm. quite easy to do stuff like that, and, and there's a lot of evidence from the IR literature. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it.